Hey there, Dangas Stu here. Today's video is about how Jamsco pumps work and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. When I talk about uh, Jamsco pumps, I'm actually referring to just about any flexible impeller-driven water pump. Jamsco pumps are found more in bigger boats, like in Renko, but pretty much every water-cooled outboard will have a small flexible impeller pump in it as well. All right, to demonstrate how they work, I'm gonna use a Jabsco I was given by Gary at the meetup in LA, so thank you very much, Gary. So let's take a look at that. Now, the very cool thing about this particular pump is that it has an electric clutch on it. So it's hooked to the engine to spin, but it doesn't actually turn the pump itself until current supplied to the clutch, a bit like, say, um, air conditioner on a car. Then the clutch will lock up and it'll start turning the pump. So you don't have to be pumping water the whole time the engine's running. So that's kind of cool, but it's an aside. Inside this pump housing, we have the impeller. So let's get this cover plate off. All right, put all these uh, screws in a tray, magnetic tray, even though they're not magnetic because it's made from bronze, I think. Oops. Okay, gaskets in one piece. All right, so what you see inside is the impeller, which I believe are made from some form of neoprene, and obviously an inlet and an outlet. Now, the way you know which way is which, and water doesn't come across the top of the pump here. It comes in this side, around the pump, and then out. When the impeller is pushed into the pump housing, you can see that the blades on the impeller are bent very slightly. This ensures that they seal well against the outside surface of the pump housing, even as they start to slightly wear over time. As they wear, they'll get a little bit shorter because they've got this curve on them, they'll spring back and maintain a positive seal. Up here, we have what's called the cam. And this actually bends those blades even more than they are down this lower part of the housing. The effect of that extra bending changes the volume of the section between two blades. So you can see here, the volume of this section, this little cavity in here, is much smaller than it is for one of these cavities where the blades aren't bent as much. So this changing of the volume of these sections is the job of the cam. Now this is an internal cam, cams you're probably more used to. This is the old cam out of my Detroit before I put the new one in. These are like an external cam, whereas this is more of an internal cam. So you've got smooth round with a lobe here, smooth round, but your lobe. So here I've just got some Yamalube silicon. I'm just gonna give it a spray so we can rotate it. The thing about these impeller pumps is they don't like to run dry. They'll get hot and you'll melt the impeller pretty fast. Things like centrifugal pumps are happy to run dry because there's no actual contact. Water comes into the center and then the centrifugal action with the metal blades throws it out towards the outside. That means that with a centrifugal pump, you will always see the input in the center, the output at the edge. Silicon's good to use because it doesn't hurt neoprene like a petroleum grease can. So what happens here is you have a chamber going from a small volume to a large volume. And this is pretty much identical to the idea when a piston drops inside an engine, it draws air in. So the same thing happens here. As it rotates, this chamber starts to grow in volume. And up inside this cam, there's actually vents in here, it's not solid. As the pressure inside here drops, the pressure on the outside is obviously atmospheric pressure. So water comes up and fills this chamber. Now, once this slope's reached its natural curve for the round section, from that point onwards, it's simply carrying the water around like a paddle wheel. That's all it's doing. Then it gets round to here. Then that chamber starts to shrink again, and that water gets pushed up through the grills in here and out the outlet. And this is happening over and over. This chamber now expands, pressure lowers, the lower pressure, the pressure differential between atmospheric pressure and this pressure draws water in and air. This is why they can self-prime, unlike your centrifugal pumps. Fills the chamber, carries it round to the other side. And that process just keeps repeating over and over. 
shrinking the chamber to give it a positive pressure, expanding the chamber to give it a negative pressure. So they really are that simple. Because of the way these pumps work, they can actually pump air, not just water, which means they can self-prime, unlike a centrifugal pump. I haven't gone through it in huge detail because I was sort of wanting to experiment a little bit, but with Renko, the sea strainer is actually just above the waterline. I can open the lid of the sea strainer with the seacock open and not flood the boat. And this obviously has an advantage when it comes to maintenance. Normally you would close the seacock, open it, clean it, close it again, open the seacock, away you go. The normal disadvantage of that is that you need to prime the sea strainer every time you start the boat up. These pumps can pump air, but they're not designed to. They're designed to pump water, so they're not as good at pumping air. So you can actually damage the pump because you're pumping dry for a certain period of time every time you start the boat. This isn't such an issue with Renko because my raw water outlet is also below the waterline. So I've got a seacock for the outlet and a seacock for the inlet and just a sea strainer on the inlet. And I'll show you why that's really beneficial in this circumstance. All right, let's fill the sink up. And I'll add a bit of dye just to make it more uh, visible for you. If you imagine this pipe is the boat's raw water system from inlet to outlet, even though this would be the skin of the boat, that's still below the waterline. So it'll self-prime to the waterline as soon as you open the seacock. Then as the pump draws, you see the water come up the pipe. And then as soon as I stop sucking on it, it goes down. Now, don't get me wrong, these pumps are pretty airtight. So if I draw water up and then just stop, the fact that the pump itself doesn't allow air to flow through it means it stays pretty well primed. That's just me holding my hand over the edge of the pipe, which is the kind of seal you would generally achieve with the blades inside the Jabsco pump, inside the impeller pump. Obviously, if that goes, the whole thing goes back down. The difference with Renko is that once the raw water system is full, you know, a bit of an air bubble because I didn't get it out completely, but because both ends are below the waterline, it never loses prime. That Jabsco pump could leak a small amount of air and it'll still stay like that. Then as soon as you fire it up, you're back in action. So this is kind of the advantage to having both the inlet and the outlet below the waterline. There's no way for air to get back into the system unless there's a physical leak at one of the hose clamps or something like that. One of the disadvantages to having both the inlet and the outlet below the waterline is that you've got an extra skin fitting, an extra opening in the hole below the waterline. And obviously that doubles the chance of something going wrong. Now, you mitigate that by having high quality skin fittings, servicing them regularly, having your bilge pumps, having your bilge alarms, all that kind of stuff, but you know, it does increase that risk slightly. Now, a second disadvantage is that you can't look overboard and see the raw water flowing. And for that reason, I've installed my raw water flow alarm. So if there's ever no raw water flowing through there, the alarm goes off in the wheelhouse. So, you know, this way I'll get an alarm if ever the water stops. I'll also get an alarm if the wiring fails because it actually takes that signal to tell the alarm to not go off. So if the wiring breaks, the alarm will go off. Hmm, that doesn't work, does it? The alarm goes off, meaning it goes on. You know what I mean? So, when you turn the ignition on, the alarm comes on, you can hear it. Then, when you start the engine, the alarm should go off, which is not on. This means the alarm system gets tested every time the boat starts and it monitors the water flow continuously. All right, well, that's it. Pretty short video today, but I just I promised I'd cover this and I was supposed to do it in the rebuild video and I completely forgot. So why not do it separately while we're all sitting around looking for something to do? All right, we'll take care. Uh, Monday, I'm gonna get in and install the alternator and the, you know, the light on the dash and everything that goes along with installing an alternator. So I'll catch you then, see ya. You guys are getting lazy. You want to be fed all the time. Go find your own food.
You've got five legs between you. Get walking. Hmm? You. Talking to you. Go.